on this cold, windy morning. I left my house at 65, but in a matter of minutes, it was something else. Gotta love Houston, don't you? Super Bowl Sunday today. You guys all right back here? <laughs> but uh, I, I was thinking about the way how many people might just miss church today because the weather was a little bad. And then I thought about that 80-something thousand people would be sitting in 30-degree weather watching a football game. <laughs> With no roof, just in the rain or mist, the snow, whatever it might be. And I thought, boy, you know, sometimes there are things in life that really just teach us the level of our commitments, you know. And uh, so often we let things control us instead of us taking charge and steering the ship of our destiny where it needs to be going each day. In fact, we're going to talk about that some. Uh, I come to you with trembling and shaking as I share this message this morning out of James. As we look at our study, we're in uh, part four, but we're starting in James chapter three in our, in our look at the word of God today. Uh, if you want to kind of subtitle this, you could call it the measure of maturity. Uh, so kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this message together today. I approach this kind of a trembling this morning because if there's one area in my spiritual life that uh, this deals with straightforward and right on, uh, this is the area. I hadn't had any problem with drinking, smoking, chasing women, but my mouth can sure get in the way. <laughs> Come on. I don't know if you're amening me or amening yourself. Because let me tell you right now, this is, this is not going to be a fun sermon. Uh, you know, I, by the time we get about halfway through this sermon, you're going, to be, you're going to be thinking, doesn't he need to preach on perverts or something about right now? Doesn't he talk about drunkards and, you know, and you know, child abusers or something? Let's get, get on them sinners. Uh, well, I looked up and we are they when you look in James. This is a, I grew up in a home with six kids. You learned to learn verbal sparring very early. How many had families, big families like that you grew up in? You learned how to use your mouth quickly and rapidly and defense mechanisms because, you know, kids say the darndest things. Well, they certainly do. Some of the most amazing things can come out of kids' mouths is and you always wonder where they learn it. A lot of it's from mom and dad. A lot of it just comes natural. And James deals with this issue, but it's it, it kind of like, oh, you think you're spiritual kind of mentality as, as I approach this, you know. That's, that, that's the way you, you ought to look at this passage. So, oh, so you think you're spiritual or you think you've arrived. Let's just take a moment and let's see how far down the road we've gotten. Uh, I, I, I learned to be very quick with my tongue, the youngest of three boys. And uh, that kind of carries on over into your adult life. And then you get into that uh, quick cynicism or, or quick cuts out of your mouth and sharp wit and those kind of things. Am I the only person here like that? No. I, I caught myself just a while ago in the sound booth saying something really stupid. <laughs> you know? I, I, and it came right out. I thought, I just got through preaching on this. <laughs> I just preached a sermon on this. And, and this is why he gets into this message. As we get into James, let's look at uh, these, these verses as we share them together. James chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. We'll read through verse 12. He says, uh, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they may obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Behold, the ship also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Verse 5 says, So also the tongue is just a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beast, birds, of reptiles, and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out the, from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? 
Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh water. When you get into talking about uh, the context of this, this passage of scripture, it, just, it gets right to the very heart of the issue of where we really are in regard to our spiritual life. And we really begin to see that uh, as you look at your, your mouth and what comes out of your mouth, it becomes a very good, accurate indicator of your spiritual maturity. And that's pretty much the heart of what he, he's getting down to. He says in, in verse one, let not many of you become uh, teachers, my brethren, knowing that such will incur a stricter judgment. Now remember what's happened here as we started this study on James. The church has been scattered abroad. Uh, Jerusalem's under tremendous persecution. The church has been scattered all over the known region. And uh, churches are starting to form, all right? And people are finding their place of service and ministry in homes and wherever they are, they're gathering. And he says, oh, as you gather together, because the way he starts out to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, make sure that not many of you become teachers. But I want to be a teacher. Everybody likes to get up in front of the crowd but not everybody should get up in front of the crowd. Some don't know how to teach. I, I really do believe that teaching has to do with spiritual gifting as well. And sometimes we think we know how, but we're not a very good teacher. But he says there's some other reason, not just because you might not have the gift of teaching or might not know how to teach, you know. It could be, that you, you have to, another indicator you need to look at here. He says you have this indicator, you know, called your tongue. In fact, if you look at, if you go through the scripture, especially in the Old Testament, it gives some real clear uh, illustrations of how uh, wisdom and foolishness are marked clearly by what comes out of the mouth. If we're really a wise person or a foolish person, Proverbs 29, 20 puts it this way. Seest thou man that's hasty in his word? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Somebody who just speaks all the time, always speaking, always talking, says there's more hope for a fool than him. Ecclesiastes put it this way. He said, be not rash with your mouth and let not your heart be hasty to utter anything before God who's in heaven and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. It's good not to speak so much is what he's trying to say here. And that's why he says, it's, don't let everybody think they should be teaching. First of all, the reason why you, everybody shouldn't be teaching, there's going to be a, a, a different level of judgment. Judgment is going to be stricter. And he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ when all believers will stand before the Lord and they'll either receive rewards or, or loss of rewards at that point in time. Now, the King James talks, says it like this, for teachers shall receive the greater condemnation. That's not necessarily a, 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 an accurate, good translation because the Greek word there is the Greek word krema. And krema can be condemnation or could be released from prison, whatever it might be. It, it's a word that refers to the decision of a judge. He's on the bench. He makes a ruling. Sometimes it's a favor, favorable ruling. Sometimes it's not a favorable ruling. But that's, he says, listen, there's going to be a time when you you know, stand before God for what you said. So in the context here, this judgment is neutral depending on what you do and how you handle and what you do with your mouth and how you handle your words. So James merely says the judgment of teachers is going to be a little, is going to be stricter because of the responsibility of teachers. And what's the responsibility of teachers is to use their mouth, to use their tongue in a wise fashion, in such a way that will bring glory and honor to the Lord. The, the, the essential instruments of Teaching or two. One, the Bible and your tongue. All right? You got to have a Bible. Your teaching must be found on that. And then the words that come out of your mouth. So he says, listen, there's going to be a standard by which you judge, you know, it's, it's by what comes out of your mouth there. And uh, so uh, there's going to be a lot come out of your mouth if you're teaching. You're going to be held accountable for those things. The second reason that he gives is in verse 2. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. The word for that, that, that begins with that, that Greek word, he, he, you think he's going to go on and discuss, you know, he says, you receive greater judgment for, and then you think what will follow next is he's going to talk about the judgments that will follow, you know, and it's going to be a lighter responsibility, greater responsibility, lighter judgment, greater judgment. But know what he's going on to say here is our tongue begins to reveal to us the level of our spiritual maturity. And one, we shouldn't be teaching if we're not spiritually mature, or at least on the road to maturity in our life. He said, listen, if you don't stumble here, you know, well, stumble is the Greek word which literally means to, to, to make a mistake. Sometimes it's used in the context of a sin, a willful sin. Sometimes it's used in the context of going astray. All right. He said, so number one is there's a judgment. Number two is uh, you stand before people and you say one thing and then you step out from talking to people and you're saying other things. He said, don't think that you're going to get away with that. Don't think that, you know, that, that you're, you can speak and not be held accountable for what you're saying. Or you can speak and, and, and not think you have to answer to God yourself. 
Teachers should be mature, I think, is the heartbeat of what he's talking about here. There should be a maturity level about your life. You know, because one, as I said earlier, our tongue will display our maturity. The tongue becomes the indicator. It becomes the, the measurement. It becomes the device by if I take my temperature with a thermometer, I can take my spiritual level of growth by looking at what comes out of my mouth and the words that I'm using every day. In fact, he uses the word perfect here. And we know from looking at James chapter 1, he used that word there. It, when he talked about our trials and our temptations, how they're developing maturity, that patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire and lacking nothing. So we know it doesn't mean sinless perfection. He's talking about here, you know, the fact you're growing. And you're going on with God and God's doing something in your life and, and there's a maturing process. We talked about Abraham in this context a couple of weeks ago. And Abraham, we said in Genesis 15 is when he has that encounter with the Lord. And I believe that's the moment of salvation for Abraham. But that doesn't mean Abraham's mature. A lot of people look at that moment, you know, and they start looking at the life of Abraham and say, boy, you know, he, he messed up. He messed up with Pharaoh. He messed up with his wife. He messed up with Lot. He messed up with Abimelech. He messed up with Hagar. I mean, this guy's a walking train wreck. It shows you the grace of God, by the way, because we are too. But then you get down to Genesis 22, and there he is offering his son, just as God said on the altar. I mean, this, what's happened between there and there? Maturity, maturity. He's walking with God. God doesn't even begin to test him on that level till he's gone these other levels. A lot of failures, a lot of successes. But the idea is he's moving towards the goal, which Paul said, I press toward the mark, the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I, the goal is Christ likeness. Look what comes out of Jesus's mouth every time it's open. Nothing but life. Right. And it also happens, I believe, that when we are really growing in Christ and what comes out of our mouth ought to be uh, 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 going through a change of where it was when we were first saved. Again, it's not sinless perfection, but he is talking about maturity. And, he guards, and then he gets into this discourse about the tongue. And he talks about the controllability. And he talks about the uncontrollability. He deals with the, the destructive nature. And you and I both know that given to ourselves and just let your tongue go for any little measure of time. And you'll find yourself in great trouble. Let's look what he talks about in verses 2. And when he says, we all stumble in many ways. If you don't stumble in what you say, then you are this perfect man. Verse 3, we put bits in horses' mouths so that they may obey us. We direct their entire body as well. Behold, the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body and boasts of great things. But hold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Such a small member with such power to make a difference, with such power to control things. Listen, the average person in this room has about 30 conversations a day. 30. It's amazing, isn't it? You think about it? In fact, you'll spend one-fifth of your life talking. So that's not so bad. Well, let's think about that for a moment. You spend one-fourth of your life asleep. One-fifth is spent in talking. Can you imagine how many words are actually coming out of your mouth? Statistics say, say that like this. If you're a man, you speak about an average of 20,000 words a day. If you're a woman... Timing's everything. <laughs> About 30,000 words a day. That means you're 10,000 more times likely to get in trouble. <laughs> Amen? In one year, your conversation of the average person, your conversation would fill 66 books. And each of those books would be about 800 pages. You're talking about a thick book. Stacked up 66 books high like that. In your life, should you live 70 years of age, on the average, you'll speak about 600 million words. That's a lot of talking. Everybody has an opinion. The strongest urge you have probably is to speak, to say something. And what he says here, hey, if you can control your tongue, you can control your whole body. Think about that. Remember in James chapter 1, we talked about all those drives 
and the urges that we have and how Satan comes and tries to get us to satisfy our desires in God forbidden ways. And we talked about the different drives and, and desires that we have, talked about hunger drive and fear, all those kind of things that make up our life, aesthetic drive. Uh, I believe there's a worship drive. We're gonna worship somebody, someone, something. You know. And what Satan does, our sin nature has weakened all this, obviously, we're depraved sinners. And so when we get saved, God begins to strengthen these drives and desires and where, where they're being made righteous and, and we're maturing in these areas. It's like with, with, with the hunger drive, you, you get hungry, you can, you, know, you can treat that one of two ways. Satan wants to, you not to satisfy that drive in a righteous way, which would be one from like bulimia or anorexia on one end all the way to gluttony on the other end. You know, in the middle, is a, there's a righteous way to satisfy it. Maturity in that area of your life is when you begin to do things that are right in that regard of your life. But what happens is what he's saying here, if you can control your tongue, you can literally begin to control your drives. He says you can control your whole body because one of the greatest urges we do have is to say something. You know, and the hardest thing for me to do, the more I have, longer I have been saved is to not say something. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, something ought to be said. But not, just because you think that doesn't mean it ought to be said. Now, I, 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 you know, my first initial dealings with this and God dealing with my mouth and my tongue was something like, well, that's just the way I am. I'm quick to state my opinion. Basically, if you listen very quietly, get still enough, you'll hear the Holy Spirit say something like, I know that's the problem. <laughs> We're working on making you something else. We want you to be more like Christ, not to be just the way you are. The whole goal here is to remake you, to transform your life into the image of Christ. And what we're going to do is we're going to start working in this particular area of your mouth. He says, so here, if you can control this, how many like to lose some weight this year? If you can control your mouth, you can control your whole body. Keep your mouth shut. You can't, can't put anything in there if it's open. I mean, if it's not open, you... Unless you're snorting cheeseburgers or something. I don't know. <laughs> you can't do that. But he said, hey, whatever the drive is, whatever desires. You say, well, I have a problem with immorality. Keep your mouth shut. If you can start here and let God begin to develop this area of your life, isn't it amazing what God will do in all these other areas of your life? And, and, and he gives some examples here. He talks about restraint and control with the first example of the, of the, the horse and the bridle. You know? The horse and the bridle says you take a bit, you put it down in the horse's mouth and you control whichever way you want him to go. If, and basically saying if you can restrain the tongue, you can control the other things that are going on in your life and you can control the other desires of your body. I mean, what are the top drives? Well, hunger, sex, thirst, those are the drives that we have. He's saying, hey, you know, all, that's nothing you can, if you tackle this one. In fact, if you can tackle this one, the rest of it's going to be a cinch. It's hard, though, because we're so prone to, to speak. He said, but it's, it's like a putting a bit in a horse's mouth. You have to control it. Now, I, I remember, I guess I was maybe 11 or 12 years old. I went out to Bobby Browder's ranch. Y'all remember Bobby Browder, don't you remember? Bobby said, let's go ride horses. That sounds fun. Let's go ride horses. Well, he gave me the ugliest, biggest horse in the stable. And I, you know, I found out later he knew what he was doing. We get on these horses and everything's great until we turn around and we head back. Now, Tim was explaining to me this week, we were talking, laughing about this, because he had the same thing happen to him when he was dating Rebecca. I didn't tell you later, Tim, that was probably a test. All right, see what, what, how bad you, how much you'd cuss if you fell off that horse or whatever. <laughs> So we drive 30, 40 minutes down the road. We decide to turn the corner, head back towards the stables, come back towards the ranch house. This horse loses his mind. Now, if I had known, if I had only been told that I could just, the palm of a turning, turning, just take a little more control, bring that bit a little further back in his mouth, I'd have had control. But no. <laughs> that horse bites down on that bit. And there's no control in him now. And I'm pulling and I'm turning and I'm screaming. That horse is going as fast as he possibly can. And I'm bouncing like popcorn in a popper, you know. 
holding on for dear life, just a child. I'm a child. I'm going to die. And he's heading for every low hanging limb he can find. He's going to eject me and he's going to eat. I, I know I'm going to die. But I couldn't get control of him. Now, when I got back, you know, it was a different story. And Bobby's dad came out and beat the fire out of that horse. And I'm saying, hit him again. <laughs> he needs some more training. But then you think about, hey, that's what we do with the Lord sometimes. We may say, I have the Holy Spirit in my life. Jesus is the Lord in my life. But boy, when it comes time to speak, we're going to bite down on it. But we're not going to let him control us. We're going to say what we're going to say. We're going to do what we do. And we just miss the mark completely. But would we let the Holy Spirit do, would we let him take control of these areas of our life? And many times we fight that. And then he used the second illustration, not just of, the, of restraint here. And this is restraint or control with the horse. You can turn him, he says, one way or the other. But he uses another illustration and he uses that of, of control of a ship's rudder. Literally what he's saying here, your tongue can control the course, the direction, the destiny of your life. That's some powerful words, is it not? He says, you take a pilot of a ship, the captain, you put him in the boat, you put him on the sea. Well, you think, well, he's, he's at the whim of the sea. What about the wind? He says, strong winds can come. This guy, how can, how can you win this situation? Little man, big boat, big sails, strong winds. No telling where we're going to end up. But we have something which we control all that with, and that's called the rudder. In our life, that rudder is our tongue. We fight a lot of obstacles in the world, don't we? There's a, the world's a big world. There's, there's lots of wind. And, and there's a lot of people sitting at, and they're complaining about the seas, and they're complaining about the winds of the circumstances of their life, the surroundings, the happenstance, and they're blaming and griping and murmuring, when all the time, you know, you can control where that ship goes. No matter what you're facing, you can still set your sails, you can still set your course, even against the wind at times. If you know what you're doing. And he says, here's the way to know what you're doing. Keep your mouth shut. Or I got to think about it just as I was meditating this passage this morning on, and got a little quiet time when I got to the church. Uh, I was looking about this between the, the horse and the bridle and the ship and the rudder. And it's almost like, like the Lord saying, all right, over here it's being able to not speak. All right, just don't speak when you want to. When you want to say something, you know it's not right, you know it's not righteous, you know it's not honoring, you know it's not pure, you know it's not holy, you know God's not going to be glorified, you know it's going to be hurtful, you know it's going to be damaging, you know it's out of anger, just don't do it. Then over here, there are times when we need to speak. There are times when the rudder needs to be turned in a certain way. There are times when we can change the very course of what's going on around us by the words that we do speak. So there are times when we shouldn't speak and there are certainly times when we should speak. And many times out of fear or cowardice or lack of courage or boldness, we don't speak when we should. Sometimes it might be in witnessing, sometimes it might be in encouragement, sometimes it might be with our children, just putting your arm around them, patting them on the back, telling them they're doing good. Who know? But wherever it is and whatever, it needs to be done. I used to love what uh, Evangelist Mickey Bonner used to say and he said, you know, we shouldn't speak till we're spoken through. You know, a lot of people just say we shouldn't speak. No, we should speak. But we should speak when we're spoken through. We should speak when God has something to say. We should speak when somebody needs a word. We should speak when there needs to be a word of encouragement. We should speak at times when we want to say something that's evil and wicked and unrighteous, you know, and cutting and sarcastic and cynical. Maybe we ought to be saying something else. And we just, we literally take control of the rudder and we turn the course of what's going on by the words that we use. You say, well, I don't have a problem here. Then you need to read the Bible. It says we all stumble in many ways. If you don't have a problem here, that means that you are absolutely mature in Jesus Christ. You've reached the mark. Of course, you're going to get on this side of heaven. Anybody in here like that? I just preached on this and there I was in the sound booth. I had just preached on this. And I'm in the car coming over here. And there's somebody acting like a crazy person. You know what wants to come out of my mouth? Yeah, just what you always say. Me too. Stupid idiot. Now, I never would use those words when my children were young. That's like cuss words. And now my own daughter rebuked me the other day because I said it. Your granddaughter's sitting right there. 
We don't use those words. Uh Uh-huh, Mr. Spiritual. (laughs) Talk to me now, preacher. How about this morning you? What was it you said to your spouse or your children? You know, and this this is where he's going with us. He says, you know, we we don't need to let these things rule. He said, you know, the emphasis here is upon what you're going to do. Are you going to take control of this rudder? Because in reality, that ship's going to go where the rudder steers it. The, The wind's not the controlling factor. It's the rudder that's the controlling factor. And that's what he's saying about your own life. It's almost like he gets a little bit uh, uh, oxymoronic here because he talks about how, one here, the control. And then he says, oh, by the way, it's uncontrollable. <laughs> the control and it's uncontrollable, but we'll resolve that issue for you in just a moment. When he talks about the uncontrollability of the tongue, he says, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, boast of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Tongue is a fire, world of iniquity, set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of life and set on fire by hell. And he gets into this, now this discourse of likening the tongue to this fire and talks, talk, talking about the destructive nature of the tongue and how it can destroy things and how it's uncontrollable in this regard. First of all, the first section, he says, hey, we control the nature of the tongue. Now he says, but it can't be controlled. Where's the answer? We'll find out in just a moment that's really in the spirit-controlled life. Can, he says, but here, this tongue is set on fire. He says, can you, the, the, the idea is, this, can you control a forest fire? We had a bunch of forest fires out in Waller, you know, Montgomery County in that area, in Grimes County, where all that thousands of acres are being burned. It started with just one little barbecue pit fire. Like that's what they finally came and, and said started. Thousands of acres burned, you know. No telling how much livestock was damaged, injured, died. Who, who knows how much wildlife and, or, or, or tame stock, whatever. But this, it, this fire, it consumes. And he said, there's another fire that consumes just like that fire that burns out of control. And it's our words. I heard a recent story about a little boy that was playing with match in the backyard. He started a fire that destroyed 230 homes. 230 families that were devastated, lost everything over one little match. Imagine those beautiful forests, you know, they're out in California. We hear about those wildfires all the time, those, those tall trees everywhere. And then just sit, all go up and smoke. He said, this is what words can do. Back in 1983, there was a news report in Australia that a fire overnight had destroyed 600 miles of land, villages, and livestock. Absolute ruin everywhere. All from one single little match. And I think sometimes we don't realize that that's terrible and that's devastating, but how much our words will do the same thing. Just the same thing. They're, fire's devastating. Words are devastating. How do you light a fire? Sometimes it's through gossip. We just hear something. Somebody said something. And so we repeat it to somebody else. And that's repeated to somebody else. Proverbs 26 says this. The fire goes out for a lack of fuel. Nothing else to burn. And the quarrels disappear when the gossip stops. Another place says, throw out the tail bearer and strife will cease. Throw out the person with a loose tongue and you won't have this problem. There'll be be peace in the midst because words create chaos. Sometimes we we don't realize just where they're coming from and we just say stuff without even thinking about what we're saying. We say stuff that's damaging and we say stuff that's hurtful and we say say stuff that's ruinous to people's lives. Because we heard it. It's what we heard. I have it from a good source. How good is that source if they're talking about it when they shouldn't be talking about it? I think sometimes we don't realize that uh, just because we think it, we shouldn't say it. Let me say that again. Just because we think it, we shouldn't say it. Is that way we are? Well, I thought about it, so I'm going to say it. Picture this. Here's Jesus. He's telling his disciples, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die. I'm going to pay the price. This is the will of my Father. And I'm going to pay the price for the sins of the world. And Peter says, far be it from us, Lord. Like, you're not going to do that. And Jesus turns around and gives us a very clear lesson. He says, Satan, not Peter, Satan, get thee behind me. I believe a lot of things that come into our heart and mind are not from ourselves even. I believe they're demonically inspired. I don't believe that every thought I think in my mind comes from me. 
This is the battleground. Your mind is where, where the war takes place every day. This is where Satan comes on the platform and starts his battles right here. It all begins with a thought. And then the testing comes, the trial comes, the temptation comes, which leads to the decision. What are you going to do with the thoughts? That's why the Apostle Paul says, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, we've changed that a little bit. We say, bring every thought into words. Speak them out of your mouth. Formulate your opinion. When what you're thinking and what you're getting ready to say is certainly not God speaking through you or not something that's going to encourage, or not something that's going to lift up, or not something that's going to bring healing, or not going to be something that sets a course for somebody's life in a positive way. How many things were said to you as a young person that were so damaging? Proverbs says, you know, words, they go into the innermost part of our beings, down deep in our soul of souls, and they wreak havoc there if they're the wrong kinds of words. They reap destruction there if they're the wrong kinds of words. How often do people do that with their children? They do it with their spouse, their husband, their wife. They say the meanest, most cruel things. And then they come back later and say, I'm sorry. You may hand me a piece of fine china and I look at it and say, it's beautiful. And I throw it on the floor and break it. And it shatters in a thousand pieces. I can say, I'm sorry. But now that's fractured. And many times we've fractured a lot of people with the words we've said. And even though we've gone back and said they're sorry, they're still bearing those wounds and they're still bearing those scars. Amen. Had one man walk out of the service this morning, he says, I am so sorry for the horrible things that I said to my children when I was raising them. Setting a course in their life just by words. Changing, wreaking havoc. That's why Proverbs says, you know, the Lord hates some things. You say, what's the Lord hate? Well, the Bible says there's six things. Well, there's really seven, you think about it. Half of them have to do with your mouth, by the way. Yea, seven was their abomination. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, hearts that devise wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, false witness who utters lies, one who spreads strife among the brothers. Half that's with your mouth. God said, these things are an abomination to me. It's in, but it's so easy. We, we form an idea, we get our feelings hurt, we have an opinion about something, we're going to state it right away. I forgot who wrote this. It said, said, you know, that if people knew what was said about the other, there wouldn't be five friends in the whole world. If your friends knew what you really said about them, they might not be your friends. You might not be their friends. If you really knew what was being said. But how often do we still just exercise those, that futility of our mouth? Ecclesiastes says, and I think this is a New Living Translation. I, I give it because I just like the way it reads. It says, don't badmouth your leaders. You know I'd like that part. But it goes on, don't badmouth your leaders, not even under your breath. And don't abuse your betters, even in the privacy of your home. Loose talk has a way of getting picked up and spread around. Little birds drop the crumbs of gossip far and wide. How many of you have ever said, <coughs> a little bird told me? And what you mean is, I've been participating in gossip. <laughs> I've been hearing things and listening to things I shouldn't be, and then I've been saying things that I shouldn't be saying and repeating things I shouldn't be saying. And destructive nature of the fire burns and hurts so many different people. You know, and it goes on to talk about, not, not only is this tongue uncontrollable, he says it's insubordinate. I love the, the illustration, kind of gets into the animal kingdom. Every species of beast, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea is tamed, has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poisons. I mean, I'm amazed. You go to SeaWorld, you see them, how they train the killer whales, you know? You go to the circus, you see them, you know, the lions doing tricks or the elephants doing tricks. I mean, people tame snakes, cats, dogs, everything in the world, domesticate them. He said, but there's something you're not going to tame. It's uncontrollable, it's insubordinate, it will not be tamed by men. It's full of deadly poison. There was a story about a church that was meeting in the West Indies. Some of you, it's like in Belize, you know, we have these open air meetings and dirt floors and stuff like that. And a cobra snake came sliding through the worship center there where people were gathered. One of the members jumped up quickly, grabbed a hoe out the back of the building, brought it in and chopped the head of the cobra off. A little while later, after the service was over, people were standing around, you know, talking about the snake and 
making references and whatever else. And some young boy went over there and decided he would be clever. With his bare feet, he stomped on the head of the cobra. And the venom was still in the fangs, in the mouth of that cobra. And within hours, he was pronounced dead. There's venom in the tongue, he's saying. There's poison in the words that doesn't want to, be, to come under control. We want to say what we want to say because that's what we want to say. Not only is it inconsistent, he says it's insubordinate. Whether we bless the Lord and our Father, whether we curse men who've been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Does a fountain send forth the same from the same hope, both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh. It's inconsistent. How can we say I love God? Yeah. How can we say we're, that, we're, that we're the children of God and we're, we're, we're part of the kingdom family and at the same time be talking about somebody in the family and putting them in down or putting them in their place or you know, treating them like foolishness? You want to see where your level of maturity is? Look at the inconsistencies of what comes out of your mouth. We want to bless the Father. We're driving along, listening to KSB jail, the radio, and somebody to pull out in front of us, and we want to shoot them. And we tell them off, you imbecile. Where'd you get your driver's license? Sears, you know, on and on it goes. So these things ought not to be. And then he, he gives these two images very clearly of the, of the well and the tree to, to draw that. He says, does a spring bu of water bubble out of fresh water? Does it come out fresh and bitter? Does, does the olive tree, it can't put off figs? Can the fig tree put off olives or, or grapes? No, you, you can't draw fresh water from a salty pool. In other words, whatever is in the well is what comes out of the well. Whatever's in the root of that tree is what the fruit is. And he said, if we're believers and we're going to truly walk as believers and live as believers, then our mouth has to come to a different place. We can't just be satisfied to live with these inconsistencies. We have to get honest with God and say, I got a problem in my mouth, God. I need to be serious about it and real about it and honest about it and say, God, I have an issue here. And enough to say, so I, I want you to do something in my life. You know, I, I'm not so foolish as to believe you remember week to week what I preach on. Half the time I don't. Oh, well, we preached on James, brother. You're in James. Don't you remember? No, we did the Lord's Supper last week. Don't you remember? <laughs> <laughs> My prayer is that every sermon that's preached, that each one of us will hear a word about something in our walk and our relationship with him that draws me closer, that deepens my walk, that calls me up a little higher, you know? That, that makes me realize how much I love him and how much I need him. That, and, and that word can be different for each of us each week. I just believe it's the, it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that does that in each one of our hearts. But here's what I do expect. And what I, I expect in my own heart, and I don't think these expectations are too high, that whatever I hear today, if it's just one sentence that God speaks to my heart, that what I hear today, I'll embrace today. And I'll walk out here and say, that's going to be different by the grace of God in my life. I, because if we don't, if God's not working and, and, and drawing us like that and maturing us like that, then we just get cold and stagnant and calloused. We become hard of hearing, as the scripture talks about. And we become just hearers of the word and not doers. And if there's one thing that every one of us, 100% of us, could really take to heart, it's certainly something from this message today. What is it you're saying to me in this message today, God? Maybe it's in the way I've spoken to my family. Maybe it's the way I'm speaking to, to others. Maybe it's in the way I, I switch back and forth from carnality to try to be spiritual. And, and there's so much inconsistent. But what is it you're saying to me? Because, Lord, if, if the power of my tongue is to set the course and to change the direction and to reach a place, then I certainly want to start using that rudder in a way that will bring honor and bring glory to him. I don't want to be so inconsistent. I, I don't want to look great on Sunday, come in and, and sing all the right songs and say all the right things. We get into this kind of performance mentality and not this participation. Performance is when I come in and sing the songs, all right? Participation is when I'm worshiping in the songs. You, you see the difference? We, we, we do this a lot with God. We, it's easy to come to church and just, I'm here, it's Sunday, it's what I do. I look at my Bible, read the Bible, you know. But we're more fun. What's really happening on my cell phone over here at the same time? 
You know, I'll look at that. Got to keep up. Have no Facebook. Okay. I always let people in church that says, silence your cell phones. Well, just have to turn them off. Because silence usually people just kind of hit that button and it kind of goes to mute. And all of a sudden it goes in your pocket. I see you pull it out. I know you're not looking up the Greek commentary. <laughs> what does that really word mean in the Greek there? <laughs> you know? It goes off. Oh, we're worshiping the Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice <laughs> to worship you. <laughs> you, oh my soul. <laughs> Rejoice. Take joy, my king. I can't talk right now. I'm in church. And watch it. I said I can't talk right now. <laughs> Let's don't be that way. You know? Let's not be that. Let's not have that kind of inconsistency and that kind of just, you know, rote mentality. They're just going through the motions. With the word, with the message, what God said, we even worship, whatever it is. Let's get down to what God's doing. You say, Joe, what's, what's the answer? I don't, I don't want to be that kind of person who's, you know, cussing people out on the way to church. You know, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy who sits there and rails at his wife and kids. And then comes to church and tries to put on a holy face. I, I, you say, what's the answer? I believe the answer is in our heart. It's the well. What's in the well? You know? And that's where he gets it. We'll talk about this next week, but he gets into that, those verses in James where he talks about the wisdom that's from God. You, know? you, you want to show wisdom of God, then by your behavior, your deeds, your patience, your wisdom. You know? Get away from the bitterness, the jealousy, all those things, all those words stir up and all that strife comes out of it. That's not wisdom that comes from God. So be thoughtful about what you're getting ready to say. Don't rush so quickly to speak. Be slow to speak. He says this in the chapter before. Let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. And so often we hear, we speak. Take your time. This is a hard lesson. This is one of the hardest lessons in my spiritual life to learn. But, I, you know, there's a lot of things in the last years that God has kept me from saying, praise the Lord, by his grace, that I would have said before. To church members, to family, to wife, to kids, that don't need to be said. Just because you thought of it. So you get to the Lord, get my heart right. He said, he said well, Brother Joe, you just said it's not controllable. <laughs> you can't, but he can. Amen. He can. This is the power of God in the Christian's life. This is what makes you different from everybody else. This is what makes you different from everybody walking around the corner. You're not like the rest of the world. You are indwelt by deity. God lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the Bible says that his spirit lives within you. And the Bible tells the fruit of the spirit is love and his peace and his patience and his kindness and his goodness. It's faithful, it's gentleness and self-control. So I don't have to say what I think. I don't have to pop off. I don't have to show the sin of I need to slow down. And draw from the righteous well of my heart where Christ abides, where the Holy Spirit fills. And you see the difference that God makes in your day to day alone, even this week. Do well to take some of these scriptures like these and like in James, he said, let me be swift to, swift to hear and slow to speak, to memorize those scriptures. Hang them in the, the hallways of our minds so that when thoughts come, they have to be filtered through, these, through the word of God before they're spoken. Thoughts are brought into captivity. Jesus is lifted up as Lord. Our words have such power. Such power. The negative ones, the positive ones, the unrighteous and the righteous. They're setting a course. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? What are you looking for in life? Where's your destination? You start framing your words appropriately. You want a righteous marriage. You want a good marriage. You want a happy marriage. Watch what comes out of your mouth. You want kids that honor the Lord. Watch what comes out of your mouth. You want a job where there's, that, 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 that you're, you're happy with and you're satisfied. Watch what comes out of your mouth. You want relationships in the body of Christ. You want a good relationship with your, with, with your, with, with your leaders in the church and with the other members of the fellowship. Hey, watch what comes out of your mouth. That's what he's saying here. Because you can set a different course if you're willing to let the Holy Spirit control your tongue. We all can. And as I said, folks, you know, I'm the first one at the altar today. 
I beat you all here. I start here. <laughs> because this is such an easy route to take in the wrong direction. All you got to do is just let go of the rudder and that ship's going to go in any direction, isn't it? Let God take his hand off the control of that rudder and that ship's going to go in circles, end up on the rocks eventually. Sunk. So be careful, little words, what you say. Be careful, little words, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. What's he saying? He says, you're going to be measured by what you say. Even Jesus said that. We're going to be measured by what we say. I'm not going to give a public altar call because I don't think there's enough room this morning. <laughs> but if the Lord God has spoken to you, I do want the band to come and to play whatever y'all were going to play. If the Lord God has spoken to you today in regard to this, maybe it's in a family relationship, maybe it's in a work situation, maybe it's in some other regard, but you know God's given you a word today. And I don't want you to stand with me. I want you just to kneel there at your seat. The rest of you can stand, but if God's spoken to you, if you can't kneel, you can't stand, just stay seated for a moment, you know, and do, and do business with God. The Bible says we confess our sins that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. What a great promise especially in times like these. God stands ready to forgive me and cleanse me. I may need to go to some others and ask forgiveness for things I've said as well. Leave my gift at the altar and reconcile some things, but make your mind up that you'll be obedient to the Father, whatever he says to you. There will be some men here at the front. All right, they may be praying first, but they'll be here eventually. If you want to pray with somebody or maybe you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we'll be here. glad to share the gospel with you. If there's some other need, just want them to pray for you. We'll be glad to do that. But as they begin to play, let's just bow our heads. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you just need to kneel right there or sit there and do business.